الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون صدق الله العظيم In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Therefore, remember me, I will remember you, and give thanks to me, and do not reject me. O you who believe, seek help in steadfastness and prayer. Surely God is with the steadfast. And do not call, and do not call those who are killed in the way of God dead. Nay, they are living, only you guys do not perceive. And surely we shall try you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and crops, but, gl but give glad tidings to the steadfast. The ones who say when a misfortune strikes them, to God we are and to him we return. Such are they on whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy, and such are they the ones that are rightly guided. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tia. MashaAllah, that was a beautiful recitation. And now we are going to watch a short video. If we could have the lights turned off in the back, please. Thank you. And just before the video starts really quickly, I, I do want to say um, that this video is by, by the movie director M. Night Shyamalan. And he is someone, he, his family, and the M. Night Shyamalan Foundation are, um, you know, it, it's just very rare, especially for celebrities and others to to, you know, wade into anything outside of, you know, their focus if they're filmmakers or, or singers and so on. But, but every once in a while, they are moved to, to talk about something that has, that has a political angle and other things. And I think that's a very brave step for anyone to do. Um, and M. Night Shyamalan is one of these people that has recognized what's going on in terms of the injustices in Syria um, and, and what's happened there. And he's been a big supporter of our organization. And this video, I think, is really important because it gives perspective uh, for over the last 10 years, really 11 years now, um, what has happened in Syria and why we are here today, why we have these photos here today. I'm Night And my wife and I, we have a foundation and we support leaders from around the world. And my wife went to uh, the Holocaust Museum and she came back and said, hey, I want to support this leader. His name is Muad Mustafa and he runs an organization called the Syrian Emergency Task Force and they do work in Syria. She started to tell me what they do and I said, wait, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant about Syria. I, I don't know if our foundation should get involved in it. That seems like a really messy thing. And I was reacting to something. I was reacting to a narrative that had been told to me over and over again and I didn't realize that. It was a narrative that there was a civil war going on in Syria that was so messy and so violent and so entrenched, there was no way that you could get involved in that area. But I just realized that I was being told a story by somebody. Who was that somebody? Now here's the thing, I make movies, and we try very hard to pull the storyline out that is the most connected to the audience, the thing that will make you come to the movie theater. That's the story we try to pull out and tell you and say, hey, this is the movie. 
this is the story, and then you feel connected to that story, and then you come to the movie. Well, in this case, the person telling the story wants just the opposite. They don't want you to come. They don't want you to get involved. So the person telling me the story of Syria is telling me a story so that I have that reaction, so that I don't want to get involved. And the person telling the story is Assad, and he's telling me the story of this violent, messy civil war that I should stay away from. But really, after learning what's actually happening in Syria, I realize there's an actual amazing story underneath it all that I'm very, very connected to. And this is the story I want to talk to you about. <laughs> It was children that start this story. These children, inspired by us, inspired by America, went and spray painted on a wall the words freedom and your turn to next doctor, referring to Assad. They were arrested. These children were tortured. And more protests rose, and more children protested. The country as a whole started to rise up. You had one city, then another, and then another. And they faced the military and flowers, and it was peaceful protests for as long as they could go. He was turning against Assad. So much so, it was inevitable it was demanding with the toppling of the dictator, and that's where it should have ended. Assad started telling his story to avoid the narrative of a group of families and children fighting for freedom to not get to us, to not get to the world. He immediately painted them as Muslim radicals and began the story of the civil war in Syria because eventually he would have been toppled and things could have worked out in the way that it should have if Russia hadn't gotten involved and Iran hadn't gotten involved. Both of them got involved for their own reasons. None of them good. Then ISIS sees a vacuum in all of this mess and decides to come into Syria. And Assad loves this. He loves this because now he can tell the Western world he's fighting our enemy. And that creates even more confusion in the mix. And so this story of this messy civil war is now entrenched and the world steps away. Atrocities are happening on a scale we can't imagine and people are getting slaughtered. Here we are, 10 years later. And how did this never again moment happen? How is it still going on? Well, it's because of the story that we were told. We shouldn't forget about the real story about children fighting for freedom. Children have disappeared. gotten a chance to spend time with Caesar, who was a police photographer who took all the photos, of, took 50,000 photos of victims of Assad's torture and brought them out of the country to show the world. And as I sat here, he actually showed it to me in this room. I was chilled and moved and I felt very much connected to those kids that their story was my story. 
the story of my dad coming to America here to start a new life, to dream about freedom uh, for himself and his family, that they were dreaming the same dreams. Uh, those kids could be me. Um, they actually even looked like me. I felt very connected to them. I live in Philadelphia, the home of the Liberty Bell and the Declaration of Independence, those symbols of American democracy. And I see in the Syrian people, even after 10 years of atrocities, I see in them that spirit, that, that wish for democracy that defines America. I see them as an extension of our story, and our story and their story are interlaced people fighting for freedom and democracy. And children started. We inspired those children. And those children should inspire us right back. That's not a complicated story to hold on to. Children fighting for freedom. I think this video does a great job of showing why attending these types of events is very important. And I will let the speakers get into more detail about that. But first, I would just like to thank everyone that has been involved in this entire process. MUSG, MSA, SJP, Transnational Justice, Center for Peacemaking, International Affairs, Political Sciences Department, and most importantly, the Syrian Emergency Task Force. They either helped organize, support, or fund this event. And I am truly grateful for that. So thank you all very, very much. So now I'd like to shift our focus to our panelists and our moderator, and I'm going to introduce them all. So our moderator, Nader Shamult, he will be moderating the event, a Marquette alum that graduated with a biomedical sciences degree. He is born to Syrian immigrants that were forced to flee Syria at a young age. Now he's making his family and Syrian heritage proud as an incoming M1 student at Medical College of Wisconsin. Omar al shukri is a Syrian human rights activist that was detained for about two years of his life for peacefully protesting in Syria. Now he is a student at Georgetown that does many public events discussing his life experiences and is a vital member of the Syrian Emergency Task Force. And Moaz Mustafa is the executive director to the Syrian Emergency Task Force who helped create this organization in 2011 when the protests started. His work on the task force focuses on documenting and exposing the war crimes occur occurring in Syria. I would like to hand off the mic to Nadir and he can get us started. Assalamualaikum. Oh. Assalamualaikum and peace be upon everyone. Welcome to you all. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, many of you have heard about Syria before, whether that be through your common news outlets or through your Hollywood portrayal of what Syria or life in Syria is like. The unfortunate reality is that the Syria you see in the news or in the movies is far from the Syria that I and millions of others who call it home have known it to be. The story of Syria is that of a forgotten crisis. And today, I'm looking forward to elucidating that story with our esteemed guests today and learning more about what we can do as American citizens living in the United States to help our brothers and sisters who continue to experience the horrific conditions both inside and outside of the country. So, without any further ado, we're going to just jump straight into it. I just want to make sure. So, uh, we're going to start with question number one, and that's going to both of you guys. And really, I just wanted to explore what life was like in Syria before the uprising. There's a lot of good in Syria that, unfortunately, many people don't talk about. So, my question is pretty simple. What did you do for fun? What places did you like to visit? And what was life like in general in Syria? I love that question. It's amazing. I... Um... Grew up on the Syrian coast. I lived seven years of my life in Damascus. So I've seen both, both kind of towns. Um, my favorite thing is not a regular thing. I used to tame birds. And I would go to the wild, bring birds, and tame them. So they would stand on my shoulder. They will fly. and They will come back to my shoulder. That was amazing. I grew up in a very beautiful nature. You know, we have the mountains behind us. And we have the ocean in front of us, a variety of birds and, and animals that exist on the Syrian coast. And I, you know, like motorcycles. I thought it was really good, um, really good, fun thing. 
was scary to learn to drive motorcycle. That took that took the last two years of my life on the coast um, before the most beautiful thing of my life happened. A revolution, you know, going to the street and jumping, saying the words freedom, you know. That was and that's where the beauty started really, you know, for me on a personal level. But Syria is as, as a country is very beautiful, has beautiful resources, beautiful nature, beautiful culture, beautiful, delicious food. Oh, okay. So, um, I, I, you know, it's a great question. And, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit sort of with a broader context. You know, Syria forever has been, you know, a cradle of civilization. It's part of Mesopotamia, the first, you know, alphabet uh, on the Syrian coast. Or I think I was, I was researching at one point, you know, the oldest um song like notes like 5000 bc was found in syria it's actually really cool you can look it up on youtube it's kind of like mesmerizing if you listen to it um but what's really beautiful about syria is that over the years it's become this mix right of all these different empires and people and uh, ethnicities and religions and sects that have been there and the reason i want to mention that is because you know, M. Night Shyamalan was talking about the story being told by the Assad regime, right? Which was a story of everyone here is a terrorist. I'm kind of the protector of, you know, the way things are in Syria. And uh, it's either me or ISIS, right? Which is completely unrealistic and not not the reality on the ground at all. But but that narrative is is is, is you know... For the last 60 years, it's here has been ruled by this by this one family, this dictatorship. But for the last thousands of years, Syria has been a place where Christians and Muslims and Jews, Arabs and Kurds, um, you know, just uh, Syriacs and, and Syri all these people lived together forever. This wasn't because there was a uh, 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 Kim Jong Un like dictator with a totalitarian state in a in a, in a very powerful security state that kept these people from somehow killing each other and living together. That's the history of Syria. That, that's what Syrians are, and that's what's really beautiful about it. I was born in Damascus, but I moved to the U.S. when I was young. I grew up in, in Arkansas, and, and I lived for the last 14 years in D.C. and came here when I was nine years old. But, but one other thing that I do want to tell people about how Syria was before the revolution and then the ensuing oppression by the Assad regime, Russia, uh, Iran, and, and so on, is that Syria was not used to war. It's not like uh, other countries, perhaps, that have been in perpetual, unfortunately, conflict for a long time. Um, they had a very, very high literacy rate. If you meet any Syrians here, including Syrian students here, they're either doctors or engineers or becoming ones. Like they, it, it's, um, it's a place where people were, didn't have war, and they had, um, you know, high literacy rate, their education. Again, not thanks to the government or anything, thanks to the Syrian people themselves. But one thing that was disturbing is that as an eight-year-old um, in my house in, in Syria, if I wanted to make fun of the president, the dictator, as an eight-year-old, I knew that I had to whisper that joke in my own house to my own mom. That's the level and wall of fear that existed in Syria for anyone willing to ever give an opinion, uh, for people that wanted to gather more than five people in one place and not be arrested later, for people that wanted to just have any breathing room, to have any dignity. And so despite the fact that there wasn't war, despite the fact that it was a high literacy rate and so on, under this dictatorship, people could not have their dignity, could not breathe. And if they ever did anything, just like in the 80s, uh, where they killed 30,000 people, but then there was no YouTube or Facebook, nothing was told, um, you know, it, it was just horrible oppression uh, by the state. And so, I don't know, I just wanted to give that perspective because things were okay, but things were also not okay at the same time. And that wall of fear that was broken by these inspirational children and then uh, the years now of inspirational people still calling for their rights shows how brave they are. That, you know, again, as an eight-year-old, I knew I needed to whisper to my mom in the house. And, and, and that's something that, that I think is, is very wrong with society, it's something that we should definitely, um, you know, be grateful for having the rights that we have here in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's actually funny because my second question was, 
although Syria was a beautiful place to live in, there was a very palpable dark side to living in Syria. Um, literally here, I have the fear of saying something against the regime was constantly on everyone's mind. In fact, I can remember a time when I was in Syria and uh, literally the same exact story that you, you said, you know, I said something about the president and my grandma like shushed me. She's like, don't you dare say something like even the walls have ears, you know, everyone can hear you. So if you guys, if you guys don't mind speaking to that a little bit, can you describe the, the sort of darker side of living in Syria? There was a, a very tangible and real oppression that people experienced. So describe that a little bit. So there was a darker side even before the revolution started in 2011. I didn't know why my uncles were detained for 12 years, one of them for 19 years. I just considered them sort of criminals because I was ashamed that my uncles were in prison for so long time. Because my understanding of, of the system was that if you commit a crime, you go to prison. As a, as, a, as, a, as a young boy, I didn't differentiate between politics and just, if you commit a crime, you go to prison. I had my uncles in prison for so long. And then I was taken to prison in 2011. And I was tortured for no reason. How old were you? I was 15 years old. Didn't understand why I was tortured in the first place. I realized that later, of course, just for asking for words of freedom and democracy and dignity in my country, I was tortured and they will torture me asking me this question, do you want freedom? The first time they asked me this question, I was, of course, I said yes. And they tortured me until I said, no, I don't want freedom. I left prison straight to demonstrations again. And thereafter, I went to my uncles and I asked them this question, simple question. Why were you in prison for 12 years? And it was the first time my uncle was able to tell me the story and tell me I was a high school student. I was taken from high school exactly the same way you were taken for the exact same reasons. You were taken asking for freedom and democracy. The difference is that you spoke out loud and at that time I only whispered. For my whispers, I was taken to prison for 12 years. What do you think they would do for you for speaking out loud? So that's the dark side of Syria before and after the war. Yeah, and I think there's not a family in Syria who doesn't have a family member who's been detained or displaced from their country even at that stage. My father, who's in the audience with us, left in the 1980s, and he hasn't been able to come back since then. So it's a very real dark side. So I wanted to uh, sort of explore when and how the revolution began, because, you know, obviously with the Arab Spring, uh, countries like Libya, Algeria, Egypt, finally getting up and, and sort of um, asking for their rights, that I think inspired a lot of people in Syria to also begin asking for their rights. And I, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this sort of started in Dara uh, of all cities and uh, with a couple of the kids, one of the kids named Hamza al-Khatib, and if you guys don't mind speaking about that a little bit, what happened in Dara and how that sort of influenced the rest of the revolution? Absolutely. And you saw in, in the M. Night Shyamalan video, the writing on the wall, you saw the pictures uh, of alive and dead kids towards the end. That's Hamza al-Khatib. That's Tamir al-Sharai. Those photos came out in the Caesar file. These children inspired by what they had seen on TV, inspired of, of the democracies that exist in the West. And maybe, maybe they didn't know what they were writing. I mean, there were still kids, and even if they were writing something bad, even if they were technically vandalizing their school, to have their nails pulled out, to, to the torture that you guys witnessed in that video happen to them, those were those kids um, that we're referring to. And when the people, when the parents asked for accountability in Dara of that governor and, and of those security forces, they were told to go home and make new children. I mean, dignity is not afforded to the Syrian people by this regime. Dignity, which is the very least, you know, you can have freedom, democracy, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, you know, forget about it. And, and so it was these children that inspired the protests in Dara. And it was the protests in Dara in the repression of the regime where bare chests were met with bullets and unlawful arrests that led other parts of the country to come out and protest. People that saw on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitter what was happening to their to their compatriots in, 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 the, in the south 
came out in, in different cities, uh, including uh, early on as well, um, as early as Dara in Banyas in Al Bayda, where, where Omar was initially arrested. Um, and that was and the I, first arrest, of course. Please. And what I, what I can add to that is the fact that we are very emotional. We react very quickly, especially to brutality. So when in my hometown, Banyas, hours away from Dara, where all of this started, where we saw kids being killed and men and women shot on the street, we could not just stay home silent. We went out to the streets and we asked, for freedom for these people who were arrested, for, for justice for the ones who were killed. We went out to the street asking for dignity for the Syrian people. We did not start immediately by asking for a regime change. We just asked for justice for the ones who were killed and freedom for the ones who were arrested. Our reaction was also faced by guns. They attacked our hometown. They killed the ones they killed. They arrested the people they could arrest. And I was one of them. And being in prison for the first time was the best eye-opening experience ever. Because being 15 years old, not knowing anything about politics or justice or injustice or freedom or democracy, being in prison taught me all of that immediately. Because I, I was taken away from everything. And everything was taken away from me. It was the first time I realized the people who are in charge in Syria are the wrong people. They have the ability to torture me, and they are torturing me. These people should not be in power. So the first minute I got out of prison, I went to protest, to jumping on the street and asking for freedom and democracy. However, the difference was a huge. I meant what I asked for. Before prison, I was asking for what everyone else was asking for. But this time, I meant it. I knew how it feels to not be free, mentally and physically, right? And that was the turning point where I realized, this is my fight. This is not just like a fight for the adults to go for it, right? And everyone in my classroom, when I returned back from prison and they saw that my fingernails were pulled out. Everyone in class, in my classroom sympathized and they wanted to go out to the street and say, this is wrong, you know. Someone exactly like us has been tortured, ha could, ha could have been killed in prison. And this is so wrong. And there is nothing more powerful than the innocent young people reacting to the wrong things in a very honest way. So my classmates went out to the streets even when I was taken to prison later for three years and they were told in my school that I was executed and killed, my classmates would go have a sign saying, we want Omar still, his buddy at least, to, to, to have it to bury him. Because they really cared, right? And the regime wanted to break the trust and the caring between these people. So the first thing they did is to kill a Christian person and throw his body in a Muslim area and do the opposite too, to try to break the bond between the people. People were aware of the regime's tactique, you know, and, and brutality. So no conflict begun between the Christians and the Muslims in the region in, on, on the Syrian coast at all. And people understood that. Well, and obviously the regime committed more brutalities against the, the, the Muslim majority, because they are majority, but Christians were with me in prison, tortured like me in prison. And Muslims from different sects, regardless if you were Sunni or Shia or Alawite, these people were tortured equally. It's not about your religion. It's about if you are with the regime, with the authoritarian regime, or not. If you are with, you get sort of protection. If you are against, you are a target to be killed, or to be detained, or to flee the country. Very powerful words, and I appreciate that. Um, before I get into talking about the Syrian Emergency Task Force, I think it's very important that we talk about how the revolution started. As you mentioned, it started as a peaceful movement. And this is very important because the revolution, or sorry, the government tries to discredit the movement by saying 
it's armed protesters, it's terrorists, it's ISIS and whatnot. But the reality is it was very different. In the beginning, the motto was Silmiye Silmiye, which means peaceful, peaceful. And I remember watching these protests on the TV, me and my brothers, and just wishing we could be there protesting. So in these early days of the revolution, what were these protests like? Were they, as um, some people like to say, violent protests where you know, people they, were trying to cause problems and violence and whatnot? They were the most beautiful things. I mean, you can go to YouTube and you could watch some of them. You saw some of them in that, in that video. People were singing and dancing. People were carrying water and flowers and roses. People didn't believe that their own government could do this to them, knowing that it's a dictatorship. They couldn't believe that their own security forces would do this to them. They, you know, <clears throat> there were inspirational songs written, you know, throughout the revolution, but especially at the beginning. And one of them uh, is called Yahif in, in Arabic, which means like, oh, shame, right? And, and the whole song is like, how could you shoot at us like we're your people talking to, to the government itself, talking to the military forces, but by the dictator's own admission, not by reality and facts and all these other things, by the dictator's own admission, there were nine months of nonviolent peaceful protests. In reality, there was at least that first year nonviolent peaceful protests in certain neighborhoods like Daraya that went on for even longer people facing again with their bare chests the most horrific torture beatings rape all kinds of things and and by the way when things became let's say less completely nonviolent and peaceful it wasn't the protesters initially it was the the actual soldiers that you know imagine being deployed like imagine you're a service member in the US military and you get deployed to Arkansas you're from Arkansas to go quell a protest to go kill terrorists there and you're like, no, this is like my neighbors, this is my town, these are my people. And so these people within the military themselves that could not do this defected one by one. And as you defect, you defect with your entire family because the regime is vindictive. He'll, he'll go after anyone that's even remotely related to you. But these people carrying what arms they had sort of then played a role in protecting the protests, which continued and continue till today, and then formed at the time, and this is 2012, something called the Free Syria Army, which was essentially defected members of the regime's military that could not shoot at their own people that then were sort of defending as much as they can with the limited ammo and weapons they have against the regime itself, which of course later on ended up having the full force of the Iranian militias, whether it's Hezbollah or uh, you know other militias that came from different places in the full force of the Russian Air Force which is very relevant to today, and I know I'm getting off subject, but if Russia wasn't allowed to do what it was allowed to do in Syria, we wouldn't have what's going on in Ukraine. And if we don't react to Ukraine and Syria today, we'll have another place that we'll feel, that we'll, I fear we'll see the same horrific oppression. But nonviolent peaceful protests, people literally singing and dancing in the streets, multi-confessional Christians and Muslims and Alawites and Sunnis and Kurds and Arabs, um, uh, it's really inspirational. I mean, Omar, you were in these protests. I mean, you can describe the scene. Did it seem terroristy to you? We, we, we were handed flowers. Uh, and by the way, you know, we were handed flowers before the protest. We would use them in the protest. And after the pro I know my mob left flowers a lot. So after the protest, I would collect all these flowers and take them home to my mom. I'm also in love with the ladies. I used to bring this flower there too. Uh, so I was like very interested in the protest for two reasons. The first one was the fact that it was very meaningful, very fun. The other fact is was the flowers Three are flowers. very useful. Three flowers afterwards. Um, so it was amazingly peaceful for as long as I experienced. During the time I was taken to prison, it was still very peaceful in Syria. Then I was taken to prison for years, and then I didn't see anything. I just hear, heard from prison when they were bombing the regime bombing these towns around this prison and hearing from the, the new prisoners telling me how people are dying and even chemical weapon attack, which was heartbreaking news to hear in, in prison. But by the way, even when, when there were defectors from the military protecting the protesters and shooting back, they still weren't terrorists. They were still within their rights to defend themselves. There still wasn't Al-Qaeda. There was no ISIS. There was no Hezbollah. There was no IRGC. There was no PMF. I mean, the list of everything that sort of came in. 
and 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 not until just years of misery that then extremist groups took advantage of, of some of that void that Iran and others and everybody else felt that they had a green light to do whatever they, they wished. But even through all of that, the Syrian people that started this revolution, that continue to hold its values dear, that if you still go to the borders or the internally displaced persons camp and ask about it, they tell you that we're facing, you know, all these types of extremists, as said, Iran, ISIS, whatever, and Russia. Um, but this is all happening to us because we asked for our rights, the same rights that the democratic world says they uphold and support. Um, no one helped us. And now we're facing this criminality because of that. And so it's simple for them. As, as and if government. they attack your home, if they kill your friends in, in, in the other house and they're coming and you know for sure that they are here to kill you and kill your family, your parents and your friend, what would you do? Wouldn't you try to defend yourself, your beloved ones? It's our right as a human to try to defend ourselves, right? And the regime has been attacking people, killing people, and the regime used the peaceful demonstrations, okay, nobody's gonna react, I just kill people and they're gonna go with flowers again. At some point, when the Syrian people gave up on the fact that the international community gonna provide enough help for, for the Syrian people to, to achieve freedom and democracy, people took another turn and say, okay, now we protect ourselves. If the guards would come, if the soldiers would come, it's like in Ukraine, you gotta protect yourself. You gotta have whatever, a stick or a knife or a hunting gun or a good gun, whatever you have to protect your family, to protect yourself. I still support that in Syria, in Ukraine, in every country where there's a conflict, where people are attacked, the innocent people are attacked to be killed or tortured, they should defend themselves. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the beauty of the revolutions and whatnot, uh, I remember some of the revolutionary songs that came out, you know, from America. We would listen to them in the car always. And one of the people, uh, he was known as the singer of the revolution. His name escapes me. Ibrahim something. I forget his Tashush. name. Tashush. Exactly. Uh, the government was so sadistic that they took this man with a beautiful voice and they removed his vocal cords. Yeah. And they killed him, obviously. Um so that, you know, this man did nothing but create art and create music for people to enjoy. And that's how they treated him. They killed him and removed his vocal cords. Or, or the artist for that, who they broke yeah, all his, broke limbs, all his and, limbs and then another years. pianist who they went and beat up his elderly parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's a shameless regime. Russia, as said, Iran all go in the same breath, by the way, as we're describing who are behind these crimes. Yeah, and that leads me to my second question. At some point, as you mentioned, there was a sort of void created by the chaos. And this led to certain uh, Western powers sort of wanting to impose their agendas. That includes the United States, Russia, Iran, which is not Western country, but still. Um, so can you sort of try to break down, as complicated as it is, can you try to break down for people what these agendas are and how that sort of, uh, in a way, hijacked the revolution and, and made it less of what it was supposed to be? So I, I would say that, and it's not limited to Western or not Western. I mean, there were, when, whenever the United Nations was impotent and continues to be impotent to act on Syria, when there were these horrific crimes that are happening there, there were very good statements like from the United States, from Europe and others, you know, Assad must step down. The killing of civilians must not be tolerated. You know, great statements, but, but that's it. They, they were limited at that. Um, then there were competing interests in the region that decided to get involved for whatever their interests were. Now, for Iran, for Russia, their interest uh, is Assad stays in power. He's essentially a puppet regime of ours. We can do whatever we want. This is a key national strategic place for Iran, for Russia. They have the only warm water port in Tartus. They, um, they have a regime that's essentially allowing them, like, free occupation of the country. A Russian soldier in Syria is not liable to Syrian law. He can, he can like rape a child in the street on camera and walk away. The Russian bases in Syria are not like leased or rented by the state. They belong for eternity to the Russian government. The Iranians who brought all these militias and, and destabilized the entire region um, also uh, you know, came in for their own interests. And later on, ISIS also emerges and and so the the role that regional countries including gulf states including other ones that that you know played 
we're always focused on their specific interests within this country where this war is unfolding. No one seemed to actually like back up, except Western democracies in mere statements, the pro-democracy actual Syrian people. And, and I want to add, and, 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 and this is important, you know, from the start, Assad says, it's me against terrorists. There were no terrorists in Syria, and ISIS wasn't there till like 20, late 2013, or 2013-ish. But, um, you know, we lost four members of our staff. Um, and we're a staff, we're a young staff, like young, passionate people, many of them not Syrian, and those on the ground are, are Syrian, that just want to do the right thing. They feel passionate about this, they're horrified by, by the crimes and, and so on. Two were taken by ISIS and beheaded. They were killed by ISIS, executed for running uh, grassroots sort of political campaigns for local councils in their Zor at the time. And two were taken by Assad and tortured to death. Um, they were helping us break the siege on Homs and bringing in aid inside, and they were captured with their, with their computers, and, and that was the end of that. And the reason I tell you that is not for you to feel bad for SETF and you know, and, and, you know, for, for, for these brave heroes, like their, you know, history will remember what they've done, but, but it's to show you that this is kind of a microcosm of what the Syrian people faced. The Syrian people, it wasn't ever Assad versus ISIS or extremists. It was always the Syrian people versus these evil forces. And Assad loved the presence of ISIS. Right now, ISIS is defeated territorially in Northeast Syria, where we have U.S. presence and our partner forces. But ISIS runs rampant in Assad regime-held areas. So the regime is either unwilling or incapable of, of, of attacking them. But more importantly, because for ISIS and for Assad, their existential threat are the actual Syrian people that want their own self-determination, that want their own country. So for Assad, he wants to kill the Syrians and leave only things like ISIS, which are foreign to Syria, by the way, foreign fighters and others. And for ISIS, they use Assad's crimes to recruit lost people and to say that somehow they're there to fight against Assad. But they fight against the rebels, they fight against the revolutionaries, they fight against the activists, the medical workers. And so for both of these two sides of the same coin, the biggest threat to them are these people that you see sitting around us that are truly inspirational. You know, Rehab, this young lady, is a civil engineering student from Deir Zor. She was in Damascus and her crime was giving baby formula and medicine to internally displaced persons in Damascus, displaced by the Russian, Iranian, and regime bombing. And for Assad, giving medicine to those he's besieging is a worse crime than, than holding an AK-47 and, and shooting at a regime checkpoint. And so she thought she, I, I know this because we know her cellmate, she didn't think that she'd be executed for giving medicine away. And she's a civil engineering student. She used whatever she could find in the prison to draw how she would rebuild bridges and buildings that were destroyed by the Russian Assad and regime bombing. Of course, she was executed. She was processed. And now she's a number, but we were able to at least identify her name and identify her family and talk to her cellmate. But that's the story of who this amazing lady is. Like, even in prison, in prison for giving medicine to internally displaced people from her own country, was trying to draw how she would rebuild her country. Um, and, and I just wanted to tell you that to show you, like, again, like who these people are. These, these are real individuals, and they have real families. They're, they're, like, they're like us. So um, I want to ask one more question before we delve into the amazing work that ECTF has been doing. And this is... Um, this is for you, Omar. And this is, I was hoping you could go into a little bit of detail describing your experience in prison. Obviously, you went through a lot and it was incredibly traumatizing. So, whatever you're comfortable with talking about, of course. Should we clear the stage and just stand up? <laughs> I am good sitting here. Um, or I will tell you, no, I actually not. Yeah, I'm I know. I know. Let's see. You got this. Here. I got it. I got it. Um, I think prison has been the worst experience of my life. At the same time, the best experience of my life. It took so many things from me, but it gave me so many things that I enjoy today. Prison has been the place that where I was in constant pain, the place where I lost 
my beloved ones, my cousin died in my arms, the other one died next to me, and on a daily basis, I had to see 40, 50 dead people in a death room where I was responsible for numbering everyone who would die, registering them in the system. I lived in the death room with all these dead bodies, tra traumatizing. I remember one day where I had some, some, I fell on the ground and I thought I died. In Syria, they, in these prisons, they don't check if you're really dead or not. If you look dead, they take you and they put you in a death room where it's locked, there's nothing there. They thought I died and they put me in that room and I, I woke up and the door was closed and I was just surrounded with dead bodies. And I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I didn't know what to do. And I moved, I managed to get myself to the door and knock the door and the guard opened the, the door and said, what are you doing here? And I said, I, I, I am alive. And he said, with very cold blood, why? Why are you still alive? And kicked me. And then I was taken back to my room and I, managed, I survived that incident. On a daily basis, I had to think, you know, for the, for in the beginning of my time, thinking about the fact that they told me that my family was killed in a massacre in my village. Thinking about the fact, even though if I make it out of prison, they bombed my school. I have no school friends to go back to. I have no family to go back to. My best friends and my cousins were with me in prison and they died. I felt like I had no value, no purpose, no one, nothing to go back to. And that thought has saved my life. Because as soon as I realized I had nothing outside, I focused on inside. And that's the beauty of inside. The beauty of it is the fact that when I was sitting in, in, in prison, I was not with criminals, right? I was with the best people of my country, highly educated, emotionally intelligent people on my right and left, well-educated people. So the person to my right is a doctor. The person to my left is an engineer. In front of me is a psychologist. Behind me is a lawyer. On the other side, that's a professor and that's an economist. And all these people are endless resources for me. A teenager in prison, aimless, powerless. The doctor, when I come back from the torture, will tell me how to take care of my wounds so I don't die from infections. And the engineer will talk about huh, how this room is built incorrectly. And the lawyer will talk how in that system that tells you how we can share our food fairly. How can you share five potatoes to 20 people, right? And the psychologist will be talking to me about how we can actually treat our trauma, the trauma that we, it's becoming, it's getting created in our head every day. And when I learned all this important knowledge, it was practical knowledge. It's not like what you get at university, half of your education, if not 90% goes to something you forget. Everything I was learning was essential, crucial for my survival and the survival of other people. So the people around me, I had to take care of them. From all the knowledge I gained from the people who were on my right and, 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 and left side. So we would take care of everyone and then people would pay you back by taking care of you. So for the first time, remember I was aimless, powerless teenager when I was taken to prison. I had no purpose in life. I was going to school, back from school, back home and study. My dad was obsessed with us studying all the time. I had, was supposed to be engineer and my sister was supposed to be doctors. And so I was studying all the time. It had no really meaning in my life. And in prison, for the first time, I realized that I can save a life. I realized that my life has a value. So I discovered my value for the first time in my life in prison. And that brought me certain, certain joy, right? But also, I had some, I had my faith, my beliefs, where I said, if I die in prison, I will go to afterlife, a paradise. It's going to be a beautiful place. And the more they torture me, the more rewards I will have in my afterlife. So when they take me to the torture floor and they beat me with the belt, one, two, three, the more they beat me, the better it will be afterwards. I'm dying anyway, right? 
it's if I can have more flowers in my garden after life, how fancy it is, right? So when they beat me, one, two, three, I you wish one more belt because you're getting it. You, you're getting hurt anyway. So you get one more belt, it does not hurt anymore. After 100, it does not hurt. After 15 belts, it does not hurt. Your skin just dies. It's just fear. And they play on fear because they know fear can break people more than pain. So I worked on my fear with these people around you, and I believe that if I die, I'm going to go to a better place, and death won't hurt me. That was the most supportive thing I felt. And I was in prison. In prison, I get tuberculosis, a disease that can lead you to death in such circumstances. Tuberculosis made it easier for me to be smuggled out of prison. My mom, who I thought was dead, survived the massacre that happened in my village. And she managed to smuggle me out of prison to hide my identity, kind of. The starvation I was going through and illness helped me change entirely. I was 70 pounds, 20 years old, and I was smuggled out of prison. I was sick, so I had to go somewhere where it's safe. I ended up in Sweden. In the hospital in Sweden, the first friend I met was in the waiting room. His name was Jacob. He was looking at me. I was looking at him. He moved and sat next to me, and we started talking. And then the day after, we connected on Facebook. The day after, he invited me to his house. I met his mom, and then they invited me home. The first time I was felt invited home to have a home in a new country far away from family and friends and everything I ever had, far away from prison, far away from torture and dictatorship. I came to Sweden. Surprisingly, the mother was the executive director of the Swedish national TV. So I managed to be on TV for the first time telling my story. It's not only my story. It's the story of hundreds of thousands of Syrians who struggled in the Syrian detention center. So we're tortured on a daily basis. And because I was in prison, because I got tuberculosis, because I made it to Sweden, I had the chance to tell my story. But also, I had the chance to meet people like Moz, who actually, you're on this side, I had the, the chance to meet people like Moz, who inspired me, who, who gave me a, a clear objectives of my life. How can I use my storytelling? How can I use what I love the most, public speaking, to help the people who need me the most in Syria? Right? And because I met Moaz, I joined the task force, which we will be telling you about. And because of that, we are here today. Can you imagine how lucky I am to see so much beauty, <laughs> so much people coming to join and to listen to us? It's awesome. So if I was not in prison, I would have never had the chance to be here. I would have never had the thought to apply to Georgetown University or to have the honor to speak at the U.S. Senate or to be in the Security Council or to be on TV. I never thought I would be on TV, right? Now I'm bored of TV. It's crazy. You see, so prison, despite the fact that it was painful, it was very hopeful because pain has some magic, you know? Pain has the power to wake you up, to make you new. It has the power to transform you from a very broken, hopeless prisoner to a resilient warrior, right? Pain has has so much magic that it could make you sort of, you know, invincible. This is like a Thanos said to Iron Man in the Marvels. I'm done. <laughs> Thank um, you, Joe. Oh, no, 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 please. I, I was just gonna say, you know, um, he's got the most inspirational story of like anyone I've ever met. And, and, and it's amazing what this person survived in, in, in the most horrific places. You know, the, the, all the pictures you see with the number 215, that intelligence branch, which is like thousands and thousands of pictures, Omar numbered these bodies while in prison as a minor, as a detainee. You know, he, he has all this hope and, and he's so inspirational and resilient, which, which is a personification of the Syrian people that I think a lot of people don't know. I, I often wished before the revolution, before... Everything happened like I wish I would have taken more friends to Syria because then they would like see how amazing they are. They would have cared more about what's happening. Um, and, and even the massacre that happened in this town. I mean, Omar's entire family is inspirational. I mean, his mother helped smuggle other people out, the only people that survived that massacre. And that massacre was reminiscent of, of Rwanda. They killed everything. They burned the trees. They killed the animals. They killed 
men, women, children, elderly, pregnant women, like they, they, they just, it was horrific. Um, but also, even within that horrific stuff are our stories of hope. One is Omar survived because he was being tortured in prison. Yeah, he watched his best friends and loved ones literally die with him in prison. Yeah, he numbered these dead bodies, which in a way actually helped him become a more powerful witness and understand the system. But, but he survived because he wasn't back in his town. They would have killed him like they, they killed and mutilated his father and brothers. And even other inspirational stories, his mother being able to sneak everyone else out. Other towns, neighborhood towns. You know how we talked about how the regime tried to start sectarian tensions on purpose, right? It was Christian towns around the town of Banyas that helped hide Muslims that had run away from Baila, his, his, where, where the massacre had happened. And there are so many stories, again, of, of beauty in the midst of all of this darkness. And I think that's, that's really important. And, and if you don't mind, I, I was wondering, can I, I was just going to say quickly about who Caesar is. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Oh, so okay. that's perfect. Oh, no, no, is that okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Great timing. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, Caesar, military photographer, the guy responsible for these photos. Before the war started, Caesar was a military photographer that took pictures of photos of accidents and incidents that happened under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense. So there was a car wreck, a drowning, a fire. Caesar would go take photos, four photos submitted with a military report to the, to the military um, judicial system. When the revolution began in 2011, they were being at, he was asked to go to a military hospital where there were 15 at that point instances, instances of death. When he showed up, he looked, and he was like, oh, my God, these are the protesters from Dara. And they obviously had been tortured and shot and killed. And he was shocked. Like, he was part of this military system. And so right off the bat, Caesar wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted to get out of there. And, and so he reached out to a friend of his who reached out to a group in the opposition, which were kind of, you know, were part of and so on, and, and, and saying, you know, I want to get out. And... And the, the answer was, yeah, sure, happy to help you get out, but would you stay? You're documenting on behalf of the state these things. And surprisingly and very courageously, Caesar remained and for two and a half years and in Damascus. So it's a snapshot both in time and geography. One man was able to document almost 55,000 photographs, again, of men, women, children, and elderly, tortured to death in the most horrific ways. And not only do that, but then compile those every night and then bring them out and then escape alongside his family, risking everything and everyone in order to show the world what was unfolding in Assad's prisons. And despite that, little was done. So he then we brought him here where he testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee later alongside Omar. And we were able to pass legislation in open court cases, which we can discuss a little bit more when we talk about that. But, but this is one man, one ordinary man, you know, not very highly educated, doesn't have any special superpowers, but, but saw something horrifically wrong. And, wanted, and, and now what he's done is become a hero to the world to bringing that out. He can never have a normal life. No one can ever know where he lives or what his name is, how he looks like, or even what religion he is or what race he is um but i think that makes it even more powerful you know and someone who who is really a hero for doing what he's doing so i just wanted you to all know who, who caesar was and how one person was able to to do so much to to show the world what's happening in syria and help move forward justice and accountability when it comes to that Absolutely. Thank you for talking about that. And, you know, speaking about Caesar, you, you know, me and you were talking earlier about the Caesar Act, which is an absolutely incredible uh, piece of legislation that you guys were able to pass. So if you don't mind speaking about that a little bit and, and talking about how you got that passed, because that's great sure. work. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Zomar mentioned, uh, and Abby is some is, is here. Um, also, you guys should, should get to, to talk to, to her and, you know, we um, we are a nonprofit organization that does political advocacy, humanitarian work, and legal work. But specifically when it comes to the Caesar Act, you know, we brought Caesar's photos. And we had him testify before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. The world showed a lot of outrage, but really no action. 
As a matter of fact, it was the front page of the New York Times, an article we arranged with Michael Gordon at the time that had that title, Outrage But No Action, about Caesar photos showing up. What's really powerful is during the time that we did have some of that outrage and people knew about the Caesar photos, Omar was still in prison. And Omar tells a story that's really powerful that I learned from him when I met him after, is that for a month, for that month when the Caesar photos were being all over the world and covered and people paid attention, people had a little bit more food, a little bit less torture, some medicine and water in regime prisons. That is unheard of, but it shows the fear that they had of people, good people acting. It showed the deterrence that, that, that raising awareness creates. It shows that these criminals are also, as much as we can call them human, human, and, 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 and can be affected by that and shows you know, what we all have the power to do, that even being far away for a month, people lived a little bit better because the bad guys feared um, action and feared accountability. The Caesar Act came about after Caesar testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and we had these same photos that we have here inside the committee. And Caesar is one of the only, not the only person that's ever like testified before Congress in full disguise. And afterwards, it was amazing. Republican and Democratic members uh, or staff members of, uh, uh, in, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, we all sat down and, and decided to see, you know, something has to be done. We can't just move on from this. And that was the inception of the idea of the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act of 2019. After five years of work and a lot of obstacles passed unanimously um, in 2019, by both parties, unanimous consent, Republicans and Democrats, the House and Senate, and signed by the president, you know, at a time when it's really hard to have Democrats and Republicans agree on anything, much less a foreign policy issue, much less an issue about Syria, where a lot of people didn't even know where that was. Um, but it's important, not because, it, it, not saying that that shows the effectiveness of, of SETF, for example, but it does. It does show the effectiveness of this amazing, young, passionate group of people that are no different than any of you here. But it shows what all of you have the ability to do. Nothing seems harder, right, or more out of reach than bipartisan legislation on foreign policy, of all things, um, right? But that was possible. And, and I think that reminds us of how great our country is here in the United States and how much power we have if we figure out how to use the right levers and raise the right awareness and pursue something to reach a goal. And the Caesar Act has been the only political achievement and the only semblance of, of, of on the political side, some accountability in the 11 years of war because of one man, Caesar, because of a group of young, passionate people, including non-Syrians, like, you know, most of our staff are from all over different places. And, and, and the amazing work of people like Omar, who came out of that experience and he could have went on and, and also just had fun only. He still has fun, but can only, only had fun in his life. But, but he does that and he finds joy in doing something for, for those that remain behind, for those people that in that prison saved him because they had hope in him. You know, people looked at Omar, I can imagine in that prison and saw a young man and, and, and thought that if they sacrificed their own lives, if they gave him the little bit of food that they had, if they taught him what they knew, maybe he survives. Maybe he makes a difference. And I couldn't be more proud or more humbled than to sit next to, to him. I, I really mean that. And so that's the story of the Caesar Act. But, but it's, it's bigger than just one bill, a bill that is really miraculous because no one would assume something like that would pass. But it shows that we have the responsibility to do more. Because um, the, the Caesar Act was the very minimum we could have done for, for these crimes that we see around in these photos. So, uh, unfortunately, we're starting to run short of time. So, before we close off, we want to open this up to Q&A. So, there is a microphone here, and Jed has it. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Two questions. So, first, like, what does the Caesar Act actually do? Very briefly, the Caesar Act does the following. Number one, it calls for more aid to or more funding for accountability uh, and prosecution. It also sanctions anything that can be imported by the Assad regime 
to be used as uh, against civilians, to kill civilians. It sanctions Russia and Wagner Group, its mercenary group. It sanctions Iran and its militias and like Hezbollah and others that are there. It sanctions anyone that's fighting alongside the Assad regime against civilians. Um, and uh, it calls against the normalization with the Assad regime. Um, and it sanctions the heads of every intelligence branch that does this sort of torture, not by name, by position, past, present, or future. That's a very short summary of that. Yes. And uh, another question, as a person, like uh, a normal person, everyday person, uh, I'm getting kind of sick of just, you know, spreading awareness, right? We could, as much as we want, we could post on Instagram, you know, that will, obviously there is an impact, but what else can we do to, you I'll know, make a bigger impact? Right. Yeah. So. First of all, as Omar likes to say, it depends on what you're passionate about, what you like. Because if you're doing what you like, then it's harder to get sick of it. Um, uh, and it but, but there is a ton that can be done. If you're interested in the humanitarian track, we have a school for orphans inside Syria, a women's center inside Syria, a pharmacy in a besieged, completely besieged by the Russians camp. We're the only, there's no UN, anything. We're the only ones running the snow cost pharmacy in Rukban camp. Um, we have a... a, 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 a a rehab center, which is essentially the center on the Turkish side of the border for internally displaced civilians that have permissions to go out to Turkey and get treatment and be returned, um, that need psychological help, that need friends, that need uh, medical help, that need support, food, etc. So there is all of that in the humanitarian track. If people don't want to get into the politics. If you're interested in political stuff, each one of you has at least one representative and two senators. And then if you have any other friends and family living in other states, we can count all of them in. And again, as a constituent, as someone who we can empower with the documentation, with the information, with anything on the ground, we can even facilitate you're uh, talking to the member, you can do that on the political side. And finally, um, I feel like Omar wants me to stop talking, but you can finish the answer to the question. Yeah, I, I think there is some misunderstanding of the word bringing awareness. I think at this stage of the Syrian conflict, bringing awareness is also providing information to relevant people who have the power to take actions. So bringing awareness is the reason, the reason bringing awareness is the reason we managed to capture guys who were responsible for crimes against humanity mm -hmm in Syria who were in Germany. Mm. Bringing awareness was the, what, what the reason we actually managed to build cases in, in, in seven different countries, in Germany, France, Spain, Norway, Sweden, UK, and Sweden. This is the kind Netherlands, of, you, know, you said bringing Sweden twice. Netherlands, and there are more, more than more than ones that I'm working on, right? So bringing awareness is, again, sometimes you get sick of it if you're doing the, the thing that you're not enjoying the most. So Moaz sometimes say, Moa, Omar, don't you want to help the Syrian people? Don't want to bring you want to do this? Think something like this. Write this article for the New York Times. I don't do it because I don't like writing. I don't enjoy, I hate writing actively, right? But when Maz tells me, hey, Omar, there is this speech in Wisconsin, this state in the middle of nowhere with nothing in it, <laughs> I would still love to do it, right? <laughs> today, we, I delivered four speeches today, right? I was in four, three different classes and now again, and on dinner, I'm obviously going to be delivering another speech. It's something I love doing. I enjoy doing. I can do it for one year, two years, three years, four years, 50, 60, right? Because what we're working on is nothing that's going to be resolved in a year or two or five, right? This is a very long process to be able to achieve justice and accountability for the people of Syria. So I need to do something I love doing. And each individual of us have something they love doing. If you are a filmmaker, we have all the videos from the ground in the world that you can put together. We've done six stories with 60 minutes, five of them won Emmy Awards. So like, like this is a chance if you're into filmmaking or documentaries, we've worked with the top people that won awards for it. We'll give you all of the same things they got and more. If you're into journalism, in writing, um, we can give you all the material and help you place it in op-eds locally or national papers or regional papers and so on. If you're into making, like literally like sewing, uh, my high school in Arkansas makes home, makes little teddy bears that we take to our orphanage there. We write letters of hope. You can you can write a picture even that we send to Syrians that feel completely and, left our own and we deliver it by hand. And this is a chance to tell you about what we do at the Syrian Emergency Task Force. The Syrian Emergency Task Force is a collection of very powerful, energetic, excited people. 
people like me and Moaz, Moaz is the only old guy we have. The Abby and people, they not, most of them are not Syrian, right? Most of them joined our work at the task force before they knew enough about Syria, before they knew where Syria was on the map, because they saw people like Moaz, like Abby, who could live a totally different life, but they decided to work on Syria, right? Even though Moaz can go and work and earn that much money, he's decided to be with a nonprofit that does not pay him enough for a long time. So what we did at the task force is we brought people that cared enough and used what they loved doing the most to be with us and to help the people of Syria. So we do political work, advocacy work, we do legal work, and we do humanitarian work. On the advocacy, everything from the seizure act to keeping the Congress updated about what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Ukraine as well, because the Syrian and the Ukrainian conflict is so related because Russia is in common between the two. Russia committed crimes and still committing crimes in Syria, and they are committing crimes in Ukraine. Same individuals who committed crimes in Syria from the, from the Russian military are the ones committing the crimes in Ukraine. So we work on both countries. We also work on Iraq. We work on, on Iran. We work on Lebanon. We work on many countries where we think we can serve a good purpose. And we have humanitarian work where we have people on the ground. We provide school for orphans so kids who lost their parents can still go to school and have good food and live in a good place. We have women's center where women can go and learn their own profession so they can earn their, their, their own money and keep their dignity. And we have House of Healing, which is a mental health and physical health center for people who've been traumatized by war. They can go and talk about it and treat it, you know. They can just be proud to be who they are, have the chance to exist with dignity. And we have the legal work where people like me who experience what they experienced can be protected, can have a good community and supported to go to the court, to file a case, to bring evidence and connect with other survivors and bring this all testimonies, to build a case to prosecute ones who committed crimes against the humanity crimes against me and my father and my brothers and my cousins and my neighbors and the people of my country, right? That's what we do. And we're just young people. In the process, we do have fun. And if you just join, you, I invite you all to join our team call. <laughs> our team call is so productive, but it's the most entertaining team call you could ever imagine. We love what we're doing and we enjoy what we're doing. And that's the task force. So you want to join? Go to SyrianTaskForce.org or get Abby's card if she has any more left or get a hold of any one of us. But is there any more questions? Yeah, well, we have one, time for one more question. If we can make it as brief as possible. Try to make it brief. <laughs> uh, first, thank you for being here. Um, 11 years ago, I was in a ballroom, uh, one over, and I was listening to my best friend and fellow Marquette alum, James Foley, talk about his captivity in Libya. Uh, today I'm here, I work at the Center for Peacemaking and I work for the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation. So there is a really close Marquette connection. So it's, it's fascinating that you guys are here uh, to be talking about this. What I would like, uh, and this kind of ties in with what people can do. Um, can you share some of like the collaborative work you do with like places like the Foley Foundation Absolutely. and things like that? Absolutely, and, and, and first of all, the person he's referring to is James Foley. Uh, uh, truly a hero. I mean, this is an incredible journalist that went to Syria to cover the plight of the Syrian people. Steve Satloff is someone else that went there. And, and this is another example, by the way, of how Assad manipulates and uses extremists, you know, in, in this whole big scheme of things. But through, you know, terrible events and, and, and facilitation and by the regime itself, James Foley was taken, arrested by kidnapped by ISIS and, and very horrifically and publicly beheaded. Again, Steve Satloff and James Foley went fight of the horrible, you know, things that we're describing that were being done to the Syrian people. And, and, and while doing this, you know, made the ultimate sacrifice. And, and his mother and, and uh, Diane and, and this amazing uh, foundation that really is just inspirational because because it, it keeps James's legacy alive in all the best ways possible. Does a lot of good work, and one of the collaborations, one of the things that we do is we we're, we're partners with 
the James Foley Foundation. I'm very humbled and proud to be an advisory board member of them. And one of the things we do is we try to work with them on helping Americans come back home, especially those, including those that are living, that are being held by the Assad regime today. There are multiple American citizens. The ones we know about are six in regime uh, uh, held areas where they see this type of torture and, and are living under these horrific circumstances. And the Foley Foundation and SETF worked together on forming uh, the first ever detainee task force in Congress focused on helping Americans uh, that are wrongfully held and detained abroad to come back home and for their families to have the right tools and for Congress to be involved in the right way. So it's a really cool connection to Marquette and it's, it's, a, it's an honor to meet you. And, and, and really, I would invite all of you to learn more about the Foley Foundation and its great work. And on another note, before we leave this room, we know, I know we're closing it soon. I want all of us to stand there where these pictures are, hold the pictures and take photos of them because we actually can bring more awareness when we show more people care about it. So if you leave this room before that, you got to suffer the consequences. What are you going to do? Just nothing. Okay. Not gonna do but, but I want to I say um, one, one last thing. I know we yeah, keep going and going and going. And there's probably more questions I'd rather, but, but it's okay. Well, we're going to come back to Marquette because this has been way too much fun. Um, slash, obviously, it's depressing. But um, <laughs> I want to say, you know, we all learn in college. We learn in school. We learn in these different places over these horrific horrific never again moments, right? We call them, it's really always again, right? Because never again didn't seem to mean much, but like, I, I like to think that I've, if I was alive in like the 1940s, I would, I would have bombed the railroads that took 6 million Jews to be slaughtered in gas chambers, right? In 1994, Rwanda, you know, people knew about the machetes being shipped to Kigali where, where nine, like hundred, you know, 800,000 people in like three months were slaughtered, right? We would have done anything we can to make sure those machetes never landed, that plane never made it, or that, you know, and, and that didn't happen. Bosnia, Srebrenica, and it goes on and on and on. But today, we're all adults. We all are Americans. We all have the luxury of, of, of internet and research and power to raise awareness or ride or do this or that. And now you have a vehicle through the Syrian Emergency Task Force to do something where we know the worst crimes of the 21st century are unfolding today. We have stronger evidence against the Assad regime than we did against the Nazis in Nuremberg. These are not my words. These are the words of, of people that worked on these prosecutions. And so, you know, don't look away. Don't 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 move on. Don't. It doesn't mean live your life depressed and, and dedicated all to Syria, but know that you know we started the Syria Ukraine network, and these Syrians that are facing this horrific stuff are some of the biggest helpers of Ukrainians on how to deal with chemical weapons and this and that. It's inspirational, and in but but it really is a never again moment in Syria. It is in Ukraine as well. It's the same culprits. And so, you know, in history, we'll look back and we'll say, oh, you know, if I was alive back then, I would have done this or that. Well, now you all know. It's a trust on all of our so so shoulders collectively to do something, especially as Americans. And, and, and so I would really invite you to just, even if you do one tiny thing a day or a week or a month, to keep whether it's raising awareness, calling your members, doing a fundraiser, giving humanitarian work, writing a letter of hope, doing a training on Zoom with our Women's Center, whatever it is, reach out to us and, and, and don't look away. These are people that if they were alive in these photos are probably more entertaining than Omar and I, are probably some of the coolest people you've ever met. And, and now, you know, I think the least that we can do is, 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 is to try to, to bring an end to the killing in Syria because it's, it is our responsibility. And it's a never again moment now we're all aware and conscious of and we're alive through. So please don't forget Syria. Don't forget Ukraine or anyone that's being oppressed out there. But thank you so much for you, for organizing all of this, for your amazing moderation and for Marquette Universities. It's really been beyond what we expected. And, and so thank you all for, for being here. Can we get a quick round of applause for these gentlemen? So it was an absolute pleasure and honor to be amongst you guys. Seriously, I learned a lot and I thought I knew a lot about the revolution being